probably a record. If not, it was pretty close. So uh, really looking forward to what the Lord has for us tonight. Uh, again, we're glad you're here. And I want to just go over real quick with you the drill before we have Don come up. Uh, we have a box over there on the information table along with some cards that are just right in front of the box. Uh, if you want, you can get up, uh, uh, take the card, fill it out, put it in the box. We'll check it halfway through. Uh, and uh, Or we're also going to give you an opportunity tonight to ask the question uh, live. Uh, you know, we'll have the microphone. We'll just go around if you prefer to do it that way. The uh, cards... Uh, gives you the anonymity uh, if you want so uh, if you don't want to know or us to know you know who you are uh, that's asking a question like that uh, well and you know we won't know at least not tonight however tomorrow morning we will <laughs> yeah we'll submit them to a handwriting analysis and uh, find out who it is and we'll get your social security number and everything else and we'll come and find you uh, but anyway uh, really looking forward to uh, what the Lord has for us tonight. Why don't we begin with a word of prayer and then we'll have Don come on up. Father in heaven, we're so grateful to you. Lord, we love you and we thank you and really we cannot thank you enough. I thank you so much, Lord, that my good friend Don is here again tonight with us and we're, Lord, wanting to submit our time to you. We're wanting to even beforehand submit all the questions and the answers to you because ultimately tonight Lord we want for you to be glorified we want for you to be pleased with everything that takes place in this place for we ask it in Jesus name amen and amen would you uh, with me give Don a warm welcome as we have him come up there's a water I'm ready to go Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Carson. Are we on here? Hi. Hi, everybody. It's uh, it's so nice to be back here. Like we said uh, last year when we were here, this group uh, came very near and dear to our hearts. Of course, knowing JD for 20 years, and then um, knowing his heart. So the congregation. I knew you guys would be wonderful because you're going to reflect him, and you do, of course. And then. Um, the jaw-dropping background you have here, and of course you guys like to eat, so you got a triple whammy here, and so uh, it's a it's it's a great great fellowship, and God is doing wonderful things. Yeah, it's been a you know been a fantastic time so far on the island. It goes so fast. This is the ninth night now um, we've been here, and we've done something every day. In fact, it's my first day off, I get tomorrow. We've done the radio. We did it today. We did it all this week, and we did it um, Thursday of last week. And of course, the conference was a real blessing. And just watching God work, and um, again, thank you for inviting us, and we're honored to be here, and we just trust it'll be a blessing. I'm always blessed by it. I always, I always learn at times like this, They're, you know, so it's a education for me, too, so it's going to be a fun time tonight. So without further ado, I'll let the, uh, you, you, we're going to do dead questions first before they get the line. Yeah, I just ca I'll okay. start off with this one, okay, and then sure. we'll, we'll just kind of go from there, you, yeah? You run it, sir. I'm, I'm at your service. Okay, so we have until 8.30. That's an hour and 15 minutes, and uh, so we're going to try to get as many questions as we can answered. By the way, if you filled out a card or a slip of paper and wrote your question down, place it in the box, and it doesn't get asked uh, or let alone answered, uh, please don't get mad at me. Uh, just get mad at Don because he leaves and goes back to California. No, no, so. come, no come up afterwards. I'll be here. Oh, oh okay, okay, yeah. I, no, that's <laughs> that's okay. a better answer. You, you, no, yeah, I'll, I'll stay until you get it answered. So don't okay. worry about that. Here's the question. Revelation 2.10, uh, Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested. If you will have uh, tested, it, uh, you will have trouble f uh, for 10 days. Mm -hmm. Explain the 10 days. Are you familiar with the verse or should I? Uh... Yeah, yeah, you can read it there, but I'm familiar with it. Um, uh, yeah, it's, I, just the reason I asked JD to read it, I took my contact lenses out. I can't read up close now because I, I wanted to see you guys. I've got a <laughs> mono vision one where I see up short and I see at a distance. When I came in here, I couldn't see anything at a distance. I could read everything up close. I don't like to see your faces, but I can more or less read it here. It says, uh, let's see, Revelation. Not in the New Testament, JD? Revelation? Okay. Yeah, Revelation, okay. New okay. Testament. Okay. Uh, somewhere, you, somewhere. Are, you, oh, okay. are you in the Book of Mormon? Or yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. He's a, the devil's about to cast you into prison. In other words, you may be tempted and you'll have tribulation 10 days. He says, become faithful unto death and I will give you the crown that leads to life or the crown of life. 
Um, yeah, the 10 days. That's, that's one of these ones commentators have never come to an agreement about. It's, there's a time of trouble and tribulation. It's obviously representative of something, whether it's symbolic of a larger period of time or whether it's actual literal 10-day tribulation. You get the, um, you know, you get differences of opinion. Uh, bottom line is I've read a lot of commentators and no one knows for sure. However, uh, brings up a, a great point though. Book of Revelation is a, is a prophecy book. First and foremost, it contains a lot of symbols. Almost every symbol is found somewhere in the scripture in the Old Testament. And so it's nothing, um, <clears throat> nothing that hasn't been seen before. But there is a principle here that we don't want to miss, even though if we don't know exactly what the 10 days refers to. And that is this, God, sends his people sometimes into trouble or allows them to get into trouble, but he delivers the righteous. Um, again, we've got the fiery furnace there in uh, the book of Daniel, the third chapter. We've got the story of, um, you know, Israel in the wilderness being uh, miraculously delivered, you know, from the Red Sea, from the Pharaoh's army. And book of Revelation, remember, this is the Lord Jesus in chapter two and three, actually writing to the seven churches here. And he's, there are promises, you know, there, there are warnings and promises to the overcomer. And one of the things here that has been troubling to commentators is the is the ten day thing, and I've never seen a satisfactory answer to to, to answer the question. So there, uh, I'm sure there is an answer. I've never found out what it is. Now, if you really want to get in detail, I'll do some recommendations. The best commentary on the Book of Revelation I've ever read is a two volume commentary by one of my old professors who's actually still around, Robert Thomas, Moody Press. It was done in the um, 80s, I believe. It's a two volume book on Reve uh, series on Revelation. And I'm trying to remember what Dr. Thomas said on this, but again, as I was going through it with the 10 days, um, I think he took it as symbolic of a larger period of time, an idea that they would have tribulation rather than a, a literal 10 days that they, they experienced it. Which brings us to another point. Some of the symbols in Revelation are literal. We're talking about literal and some are symbolic and again, trying to find out which is which. And we did the basic rule interpretation here last week, didn't we? Did I tell you guys that? Yeah, if the literal sense, you've done that. If the literal sense makes good sense, right? Seek no other sense, lest you come up with nonsense. Okay, um, you try and take it literal. JD, how do you do the 10 days? What do you take that as? You know, I've heard uh, different uh, commentaries on it. One uh, tried to liken it to, in terms of typology, the, uh, the uh, 10, uh, uh, I want to say kings, but not kings, not, not the, the 10. Um, in other words, the, the 10 days was, and he took it back to 10 different periods under 10 different rules. Uh, by okay. Historicist yeah. view of Book of Revelation type of thing. Yeah, well, we exactly. 10 times of history yeah. and that. Yeah. yeah. And that's the problem because it's not that clear. It's so, not that clear, no. By the way, which, which we may want to explain that, the historicist view believes Revelation has been fulfilled the last 2,000 years through history at different times. And so they find the rise of the Roman Catholic Church, the rise of Islam, uh, and again, successive rulers, periods of time. And so sometimes people take that as possible interpretation. But remember, again, it was written to a definite church at a definite period of time going through definite issues and problems. So whatever the 10 meant to them, um, you know, they understood it, whether we understood it totally or not, we just don't know. But that's one of the ones that, you know, good people uh, disagree on, and I don't claim to have the, the answer on that one. I've, like I said, I've read different answers, nothing ever satisfied. I'm sure somebody's yeah. got it, but I don't. Yeah, good question. Okay. Good way to start out. I don't Let's, know the answer. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> right great. Well, let's just close get, in prayer. Thank you for get, coming. Yeah, get, yeah, get another, <laughs> give me another one I don't know now. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and take one from uh, you. If anybody has one, just raise your hand. We'll bring a microphone to you, and uh, you can uh, surely ask it. Yeah, Jenny, you want to? Yeah. Mike, you want to, uh, Jenny's got a question back there. Thank you, Don. Um, in Judges chapter 3, the word tells us about Ehud, um, that he's the, one, the man that stabbed King Eglon. And twice in that chapter, it mentions that he was left-handed. Is there any significance to that? Tremendous significance in the fact he was left-handed there. Yeah, it's interesting. Why? Because how he got by the guy, remember this Ehud, when he, he, he stabbed the, 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 the King Eglon, a large king, extremely large king? Um, yeah, he was left-handed. Why is that significant? Well, most people in those days were right-handed. So when you go past the guards, you know, they would have you lift up 
the left-hand side to see if there was a sword there. And you, you lift that up, no sword, you could pass. Since this guy was left-handed, he lifts up this side, there's no sword, so he would have got past the sentries there. That's why they emphasize his left-handedness. And so when he drew the king closer, remember, he pulled out from the opposite hand. Yeah, and so that's, that's why he... That, that's the significance there. And that's why God, you know, chooses everybody for the ministry, right? Here was his gift. The guy was left-handed. That's all he had to do. You know, he had to find a left-handed guy that was good with the sword. And um, that's who, you know, God used at that particular time. And, and interesting, you go through the judges, you find things like that. People didn't have a whole lot of ability, but God used what they have to deliver. And the one thing that Ehud had, his great gift was he was left-handed. Beyond that, I, he could run fast, too, I guess, because they didn't catch him. But... Uh, <laughs> A left-handed guy. But yeah, there is significance in that because most people were right-handed, so when you would go through, they would check the left side where the sword would, where you would draw from, the fact that there was no sword there, you may pass, and he got the king. You can answer one of these, at least. Have a good question. Yeah. <laughs> a good question on tongues. I've heard two different views on Christians speaking, praying in tongues. Can a Christian ask for the gift of praying in tongues and receive it? Or is that gift only given to who God chooses to give it to? Okay, great question. We can ask, you know, there's nothing wrong with ask. We have not because we ask that, but God gives severally as he will. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, let me give you the last couple verses there. Chapter 12, is it 12? Oh, it's 2 Corinthians. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14, where he's giving the whole uh, thing on spiritual gifts, starting at verse um, 29 through 31, there's seven rhetorical questions there. And they all demand, well, seven questions, not rhetorical, seven questions demands a no answer. Are, are not all apostles? Are not, are they? No. Are all prophets? Are all, all, are, are not prophets? Are they? No, they're not. All are not teachers? Are they? No, they're not. All are not workers of miracles? Are they? No, they're not. And then we've got this uh, tongue speaking down there. The Greek demands a no answer. They're not all, all don't speak in tongues, do they? And it assumes the way it's worded is a no answer. So no, not everybody does. Here's what you do. Um, in fact, what's interesting there, it's, where is it? That's uh, in, uh, about desire, that's the end of 13, is it? Uh, desiring the best gifts, or what am I thinking there? Uh, yeah, here we go, the end of chapter 12, uh, be zealous uh, for, for, this, uh, for the better gifts, but yet I, I show you a more excellent way. It's interesting there, um, as an aside, the verb there, it says, you are zealous for the, uh, the gifts, the, the, the better gifts. Now, that can be taken two ways. It's either a command or making a statement. It's either telling them they're zealous for the greater gifts, they're, they're, they're checking them out, or he's, he's either commanding them or he's just mentioning a fact that they are seeking the greater gifts. The, uh, this one here is ambiguous in Greek because the same form can be either a command or can be a statement. And so he's either saying, you are zealous for the greater gifts or be zealous for the greater gifts. But the point is, even if you are, these seven different gifts that are there, that are mentioned, all are framed, the way the question is framed, demands a no answer. So all aren't apostles, are they? No. All, all don't speak in tongues, do they? No. But you can ask God for the gift. You have not because you ask not. And so um, God gives gifts severally as he will to do what? to build up the body of Christ. Now the gifts are for each other. We have gifts. Each of us have a gift to build up one another. And that's what we're here for, to help each other out in the body of Christ. And not everybody has all the gifts. You have gifts I don't have. I need you and I need your gifts. And so we need each other. And that's why we're a body working together with Jesus as the head. So yeah, you can ask for the gift. In fact, you could take that as an imperative, as a command there in uh, chapter 12, verse 30. Is it 31? Yeah, it looks like a one there. Uh, 31, be zealous of the uh, better gifts, of the greater gifts. Um, but even if you want them, again, you can't get it unless God sovereignly gives it to you. But you can always ask. Okay. This is an interesting question. Uh, please explain this passage. Now, this is Isaiah 57.1. I'll read it to you. Yeah, this is the okay. NLT. Okay. But then not on the question is a verse that um, I want to read out of Ecclesiastes 7 okay. uh, out of the NIV. Okay. Here's the Isaiah 57 okay. passage, and then here's the question. Uh, Good people pass away, the godly often die before their time, but no one seems to care or wonder why, no one seems to understand that God is protecting them from the evil to come. Uh, this one here says in Ecclesiastes 7.16, Do not be over-righteous, neither be over-wise, why destroy yourself? Do not be over-wicked and do not be a fool, why die before your time? 
Uh, can you explain at least the Isaiah passage uh, about, okay. Yeah, okay. It, was that a quotation from the Isaiah passage there rather than just a question? Yeah, they want you to explain the Isaiah uh, passage uh, about good people pass away, the godly often die before their time. Yeah, yeah, they do. And this is, this is an interesting uh, point that uh, for a couple different reasons there, sometimes the godly die before their time because they get into ungodly things. And I've got examples in, that I've known in people in, in the ministry, people I've had under me in the, in the fellowship that uh, I believe the Lord, they were godly people, the Lord took home prematurely because they would not give up some sin in their life. First John chapter 5 talks about a sin that leads unto death. I think that can happen. Number two, yeah, I have to understand something else. In the Old Testament, uh, it, it seemed prosperity meant a long life. And if you died early you, and you weren't rich, it was assumed that you were not following God, you were somehow not prosperous. What Isaiah is saying there is no, sometimes the good, you know, they do die young for whatever reason. Um, his ways are not our ways. In the same section there, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says, His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are his ways higher than our ways, and his thoughts above our thoughts. And the psalmist wondered about that too. You remember like, Lord, how come the wicked seem to live forever? You know, when the, and the good die. You ever wonder that? You know, we, we seem, um, you know, here's the old drunk guy down the street that everybody can't stand. The guy lives to be 98. And then, you know, these the wonderful people, uh, you know, get cut down in the prime of life. It, it's a difficult question, but w there's a principle there that sometimes the good do die young. Why? We don't know. Two passages I really want you to know. The one I quoted, Isaiah 55, 8, and 9, and also Romans 11, 33 is one I think you all need to underline in your Bible, where it says his ways are past finding out. Sometimes God allows things like this to happen, even righteous good people to be cut down in the prime of life, for whatever reason. And, uh, you know, just like you've seen in the old battles, you know, where the guy gets shot, you know, that's holding up the flag and somebody picks it up and runs with it. It's that sort of thing. When someone, um, you know, gets meets the Lord at a, at a premature premature death, many times God raises up people where someone feels the call on their life to, you know, to pick up the banner and move forward. So we don't know this side of heaven why certain things happen. So the why questions are one we can't totally answer, but we do know this. God allows it to happen sometime. So someone else can stand forward, step up in the gap when normally they wouldn't have. And I think only in eternity we'll find out the why answer to that. Now Ecclesiastes, remember that, it's written from under the sun. Solomon there now writing through divine inspiration, but a man with wi wisdom looking from a human level. And that's why he will make uh, statements there that will actually be contradictory to other parts of scripture. And that's why it, the book of Ecclesiastes is a favorite of the cultists, Jehovah's Witnesses, kooks, and like that, that'll quote out of context some of the things that were there. What's the difference between a, you know, a, a dead dog, a dead human being? Uh, who knows whether one goes up, their spirit, one goes up or one goes down? We don't know. Did we do that last year, by the way? Did, was, would I tell you guys about the spirit going up and down? Yeah, I did. Okay, didn't I? Well, did I or did I not last year? Did I? I don't think you did. I don't, about the, um, who knows whether, you know, the spirit goes up or goes down with a dead person where an animal's you know, goes up and I didn't do that. Oh, no, you did. Yeah, uh, last week about, we were talking about animals. That yeah. was last Thursday. Yeah, you did. Yeah, I you did? did. Yeah. I did? Yeah. I don't remember it last Thursday. No, I, no, no, <laughs> I, know. I, I, know yeah. I didn't do it last Thursday. I didn't do, no, when I talk about the breath, where you can see the breath, did I do that last I don't year? think you did that, no. Uh -uh. Okay. Um, I was reading, and, and the only time I've ever seen it was the uh, Berkeley version, and it, it said per, perhaps Solomon noticed about, you know, how we know whether animals, you know, they're, they, when they die, they go down, they don't, don't go to heaven, and humans have a divine nature. And he said he probably noticed when on a cold day, of course, you don't ever have those here in Hawaii, you would notice this, but if you ever go to the mainland, they actually have cold days, where actually, <laughs> uh, when the days are cold, you can see your breath. Now, the next time you go on a cold day and watch the breath, notice something, and this is the truth, and I didn't, you know, I read this in the footnote, I did know it's true, but it is true. Whenever we breathe on a cold day, our breath goes up. Animals, they all go down. Oh, now one goes up. Huh. It's, and, he, and Solomon noticed this. And I remember reading that, goes, is that true? So I've noticed it, and it's true. When we breathe out, we can see our breath. We go up, all animals go down. Interesting, isn't it? God may be saying, huh. we are made for all eternity. So interesting question. That's so, pretty cool. Yeah, it's neat. I, I read that and noticed, is this true? And then I've, I've watched over the years. Yeah, it is true. Okay, let's take another one from uh, somebody. Anybody want to? Yeah, lay two. Yeah, I want to give it up. Hi, Don. Hi. 
I've taught on this before, but I wanted to hear your take on it, and it's Romans chapter 2, verse 14. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law unto themselves, who show that the work of the law written on their hearts, their conscience, that's the key word there, I guess, also bearing witness and between themselves and their thoughts, accusing or excusing themselves in the day that God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. And the word that I wanted to, to just focus on there was conscience. Yeah, the conscience, that, that part of us that, that understands that God gives us, that knows the uh, distinction of right and wrong that we all have. The Gentiles, the non-Jews, wherever you go in the world, you will find wherever you know we go we find people who have laws every society is governed by laws there's a conscience there wherever you go you'll find uh, a murder is something that's looked down upon that's frowned upon there's certain <coughs> rules and regulations that god has given within the nature of human beings so sort of a universal moral code a, gen a generic moral code that most people hold and, and paul's saying even you know even gentiles you know hold that they understand you know there's certain things you should do and should not do stealing is uh, universally looked on as wrong murder and the such like. And so what he's saying is there's that witness there in the heart that God has given. And here's the great thing about this. Because God has done that, that's keep, kept humanity from running more rampant. Now can you imagine what would happen if the human race were left without any moral basis whatsoever, without any conscience or guide? How, I mean, it's bad enough as it is right now, but what he's saying, it could be a lot worse, but God has given, you know, there's a universal generic morality that people know to get along in society certain things you have to do you know your, your your neighbor next door you don't you know you don't murder them you don't kill them that's frowned upon you don't steal from them you don't do things like that so he's comparing even the gentiles know that they have that law now what's also interesting in that whole section there he talks about the objective witness to which nature nature itself tells you that there's something bigger than you the gentiles have that witness not only the moral code that tells them you know there's a right there's a wrong but there's a universe out there, like Francis Schaeffer said, it's not just a handful of pebbles thrown out there. There's a regulated universe where, you know, you could, there's, there's order and precision in the universe. And then there is a moral code that even unbelievers, tribes, Gentiles, non-Jews have that tell us certain things are right, certain things are wrong. Well, where did that come from? Well, it came from the lawgiver. And that's why even if they sin uh, apart from having the law, they know the difference between right and wrong that's instilled in them. And that's what the, basically the Bible has said. Even with our fallen nature, we know certain things are right and certain things are wrong. We were talking, was it yesterday, the day before on the radio, in the ancient world, there are no atheists. Atheism has to be educated. And you have to be educated to be, believe that God doesn't exist. In other words, when you get educated beyond your intelligence, then you can know that God doesn't exist. But until that time, you, you, you know, people believe everywhere universally believe there was something bigger than them you know, that, that existed. It's only now where we're so smart, we, we know all these things that God doesn't exist. That was the, that's tongue in cheek, by the way, that last thing. Okay, next question. <laughs> this is interesting. Uh, question slash comment. Hawaii has many cultural traditions many of which are embraced by local oriental families which are not based on actual real Christian Bible-based values. Some have idols passed on to second and third generations, etc. I'll list a few. One, bond dancing to honor a past ancestors, the Buddhists. Uh, two, fireworks to chase bad spirits. Three, floating small boats with a light inside honoring family members and friends. Please comment on these practices of many in our state. Yeah, th that's interesting. It's not limited, obviously, here to Hawaii, but many cultures around the world have traditions. It's, um, and this is an interesting question because it's sort of like, uh, you know, this is the way we honor our, you know, in some cultures, ancestor uh, appreciations elevated. It's very high. And some, they're afraid of the ancestors. They're afraid they'll come back and haunt them if they don't, you know, treat them rightly. And so they have these traditions, and you mentioned a few of them here, and they're, they're literally, you know, around the world, some countries more than others, you, but you see them here with the variety of cultures in Hawaii. Um, okay, here's how you gotta deal with that. Um, when you get a situation like this, first of all, just like when I was, I'll give you the illustration, in India, all these rituals they go through, I would ask the Indian people, now, you guys do this, how many of you actually believe something's going on here? And nobody raised their hand. Okay, why do you do it? We do it because we do it because we do it. All right. I think if that's the situation, it's not a big deal. It's a problem when you actually attach something to it. And that, I think, is where you got to draw the line. Because if you start thinking about it, there are traditions we have as Americans that we do. You, you kind of take them back to its beginning, and they have very much pagan roots, but no one believes this stuff anymore. For example, when you sneeze, what do you say? 
God bless your Gesundheit. What do you do with your hand? Cover your mouth. You know why? Or originally? So your soul wouldn't escape. That's why they did that. It had nothing to do with sanitation. They would cover their mouth because they believed when they opened the mouth, their soul would escape or a demon would come in. So when they said Gesundheit or good health to you, basically the mouth was covered by the hand. So either the soul wouldn't escape or a demon wouldn't jump in. Now, how many people, now that doesn't mean we should, you know, not cover our mouth and sneeze. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is originally that's where that custom came from. And there are many, many customs like that around the world. So I guess it depends on the particular one and what kind of credence you give to it. Uh, is this something, you know, a tradition that you, um, you know, you, you do just out of, uh, just because you do it? Or is it something that you really uh, put some stock in? If people think something's going on there, then, then you've got to, then I think that's where you start drawing the line. In other words, we're now going to go out and celebrate the, uh, the uh, life of our ancestor here by doing this. And by doing this, their spirit's going to join us here in this way. And I think that's where you draw the line. But if you're just doing this, be, and, and that's why I always ask, why do you do this? And just as an aside, the first time I was in, where was it? Uh, New Delhi, Bombay. Um, Bombay. I um, was walking around the streets uh, one day. Actually, you know, if you're a Westerner, all of a sudden you've got everybody and their brother wants to give you a tour. And of course, their hands out at the end of that. But uh, it was interesting. I walked down this one street. I've never seen it. You've got a Roman Catholic church next to a, a, a Hindu temple, then you've got, a, you've got a, um, a Jain, Jainism, a shrine there. You've got about five different ones on the same street, all like next to each other, like door number one's here, door number two's here, door number three there. And I actually saw a funeral where they actually, uh, they had a, a funeral pyre, and the guy was saying, you want to see a, a, a Hindu funeral? I said, well, yeah, I'm here. And, and actually, they went through the ceremony, and they lit the guy, and the guy's sitting there, and you know, they, they burned the body. I didn't stay for the whole thing, but they, they did that. And I was asking some of the questions, what exactly they believe, why they did that. And basically says, well, we just do it out of tradition. No one really believes this stuff here. And so I guess that's kind of <laughs> almost kind of the answer I would give to something like that. Do you really believe something's going on? And when I, we talked to this one Hindu guy, he said 83% um, of the nation is Hindu. But he said my age, and he was probably 30, he says oh, most of us are atheists. We don't believe in anything. So. I guess it depends on the situation there. But if it, if it is bothersome, then you don't participate. By the Any way, the, yeah. I was going to uh, ask you, when we say hi and hello, yes. is, is that, we, do we say hello because they used to say hell is low and heaven is high? I haven't heard that before, but it could very well be. Yeah, no, I, I have heard that. I know heard that. means God, you know, God be with you, that too. So yeah. hi and hello. Hi, be. they used to say heaven is high, hell is low. And then they shortened it, hi, hello, yeah. I don't know. That's, uh, he just made I don't feel, no, well, I'm serious. I, it sounds good. I don't know. I don't feel bad now because you don't know, so, because I didn't know either. I haven't heard that one before. I have not heard that one. Okay, Dave's got a question. Okay, sure. Yes. You hear me? Okay. Yeah, okay, Dave. Um, in Genesis 32, verse 24, where okay. it says, uh, the Lord, uh, knocked uh, Jacob's hip out of joint. Uh, what was the the reason he did that? What was the reason he did that? Remember what happened there in, in Genesis? Jacob wrestled all night with the angel of the Lord, right, or the man that he recognizes that. And um, again, we're not specifically told why he did it. So if we're not told why, we don't know. But here's what we surmise, okay? Jacob was a person who tried to do the right things in the wrong way. You ever notice that in his life? Here's a guy, you know, please God, I'd rather do it myself. I'd do it my way. And he was, um, at the end of the day, he tried to do the right thing, but he did it in the wrong way. And it's a lesson for us. And so what the Lord did, from what I understand, not being, you know, a, a medical person, but that, that one thing that the Lord did to him was probably the most, a very painful and difficult uh, injury he gave. So his whole life, every time he took a step from then on, he would be reminded of his wrestling with the Lord to be obedient to God. Now, there's a wonderful lesson in there for us, isn't there? We don't want to get to that point, do we? So we want to say, Lord, I give up before that time. But the fact was, remember, he's wrestling all night, literally with this, this, this one that the Lord had sent. And if you get to that point, you know, God has to, you know, subdue you. And he subdued him in such a way where Jacob would never forget. So every single step Jacob took the rest of his life, he would remember that and call to mind the things of God. So I think God used that as an illustrated message, which, dear God, do not let us have to have that experience. Right? Let us learn the easy way, not the hard way. Yeah. 
Good. Uh, this is a baptism uh, regeneration uh, oh, okay. question. Sure. Uh, yeah. Aloha, Don. Aloha. Is baptism very important but not a requirement for salvation? Yes, it's very important, but it's not a requirement. First Corinthians 1.17, Christ sent me but not to baptize but to preach the gospel. Notice what he says. He didn't send me to baptize. He sent me to preach the gospel. Well, they can't be the same. He puts them in antithesis, right? The gospel and baptism, water baptism, are not the same thing. Baptism is an outward sign, an outward expression of an inward you know, experience that we have. We are baptized in water for a public display of our faith in Christ. Remember what Jesus said, if you confess me before people, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. First century, what was confession? How was it done? Water baptism. You did it publicly. And speaking of India, when I was there, they told me there are places in the country you can uh, go to church, you can confess Christ, you can claim to be a believer, but the moment you are baptized, the moment you take a public stand, your life is in peril. And that was, and that was, you know, that public stand there. So that's why baptism, we try and do it outwardly, outdoors, not within the four walls. You don't have a baptistry here, do you? We do out oh. here, but this time we're doing it at the beach. Yeah, yeah. There you go, because you want to do it publicly, yeah. because you want the world to know, and that's the whole idea. If you can possibly do it, and I know some places you can't, but you can possibly do it outside. In fact, it's funny, in Maine, they actually cut a hole in the ice in wintertime. No. And they, seriously, and, and, no. and I'm sure it's a real quickie. And uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, you know, they in them out, you know. And probably, uh, I'm sure some in the congregation says, Pastor, what about the doctrine of sprinkling rather than immersion? You know, like, but baptism is something we all should submit to because I'll tell you something. As one who's been baptized and who has baptized people, something really, really wonderful happens. It's like you're buried symbolically with Christ in the water and you're raised in newness of life. And when that happens, something really tremendous, you know, God sometimes just uh, um, does something in a very special way. Um, we've done tens of thousands of them in Corona del Mar in the last 30, hmm. 30 years, and so, 40 years in Southern California. And uh, the, the best one, uh, Pastor Chuckle, one of the early ones, uh, guy got out there and you know because it's like washing away sin symbolic me and the guy says chuck hold me down for a long time i got a lot of sins to wash away and some of us need to be held down for a few minutes i think but uh, the good news is it's symbolic of, of what we've yeah. done but it's the sins being forgiven but no it doesn't save you it's it's a outward sign of an inward faith yeah good good okay let's go to you now anybody and raised Oh, everybody's being bashful and shy. Okay. When was this group ever bashful? Yeah. Just, <laughs> they're asking really good questions, but no, you guys are. are excellent. Definitely. Good, good questions. Hi, Don. Hi. I'm Stephen. Hi, Stephen. Uh, my question is uh, on worship. And um, uh, what are your thoughts about the different styles of worship with different <laughs> denominations? Because I, I guess with... with uh, Churches like us uh, were considered evan evangelicals, mm -hmm. Christians. But I, I've, I've heard that, yeah, you know, some churches are, well, with evangelicals, I guess um, I've heard said that um, th there's not much reverence in, in, our, in our worship compared yeah. to some other liturgical type churches. Yeah. And, and so I kind of want to get your opinion on it. And, um, and also, how, how does it tie in maybe with uh, Revelation 6, where, um, where is this? Revelation 5, 13, where it says, And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and such as are in, this, in, in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and, and worshipped him. Um, and like for myself, if I was there, if I was to be there, I mean, I, I would fall prostrate down yeah. on my face. So now what, what are your thoughts? Stephen, great, 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 great question here. Um, <clears throat> as one who's traveled, I've seen every type of worship imaginable you can imagine. I've seen ones where, I mean, the place is, uh, you know, they're swinging from the chandeliers back and forth and that. And other ones, they're all sitting on their hands the whole time and worshiping the Lord. In fact, there was one church, I'll never forget it. The, um, the people sat there the whole time of the talk and expressionless. As, you know, I remember, I'll never forget, I can think of it as, as yesterday. It was about a, maybe 100 people in the audience that did a Friday night thing, and there was a, I was the special speaker, gave like an hour talk, and they all sat there the whole time. And the first person came up to me was the uh, pastor, and he was totally expressionless the whole time. And he said, 
That's the most exciting anointed talk I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> and I got about 10 of those afterwards too, but with the same, ex they, they weren't allowed to, to, to show any expression. I, and you know, here I am, you know, you, you can imagine, I was out there doing this and that and myself, I'm thinking, is it that bad, you know? And uh, I thought it didn't sound that bad, but uh, that's what they were used to doing. Others, again, because of the nature, Worship is something where, all right, when we get together to worship, we're coming into the presence of the Lord. There should be that reverence, that respect. There should be something very um, honorable, respectful there. We don't do it flippantly. I have sometimes problems with some of the songs that are sung um, in worship when they used to do some of the hand motions, not for kids, but when some of the adults did it, it's almost, you know, almost juvenile in doing it. I think you kind of lose some of the respect there. Um, I haven't seen many of those recently. I remember in some of the old days we did it. I tell you, one of the most wonderful spiritual experiences I ever had, speaking of liturgical worship, when I was in Europe in 1979, did uh, two semesters I studied in uh, Strasbourg, France, in the theology and law program. And in Strasbourg, was the, the cathedral there was begun in the, something like 1354, it took several centuries to build. It's one of the most magnificent buildings I've ever been in. It's an old you know, cathedral there with the stained glass windows. And I came in one time, and I sat in one of the pews, and there was like a um, choir singing. And uh, I was just looking around, and I, I don't tell you the truth, I've never felt the presence of God so heavy in my life as that particular time. So I'm looking around, I'm thinking of the centuries that people actually came in this building, bowed their knees to the living God, and it was just something majestic about it, I guess. I think sometimes we can lose some of the majesty because, you know, we go the other way because there's so much, you know, tradition and, and, and you know, ceremony, you know, we think, well, we're, we're, not, we're gonna get right to the Lord in that. But there was something about it there. I thought, you know, sometimes I think we may lose in, in, in our worship. There was, there was a majestic nature and quality to it. It's hard to even explain, but it was just, just wonderful. But again, it's in, we come in as individuals and we worship the Lord. We give him the honor and the glory. We don't draw attention to ourselves. All of your worship here, you know, you draw it to the Lord right away. And that's how it should be. Um, Don Carson, in his book called The Gagging of God, talks about an advertisement he read a number of years ago for a church. And no kidding, this is how it advertised the church. Entertaining worship. Now, he said he didn't know whether to laugh or cry when he read that. Worship is not meant to be entertaining. Worship is meant to bring us into the presence of the Lord. And so, yeah, I've seen, you know, across the board, sometimes it's difficult to worship when you can't understand the lyrics. It's difficult to uh, worship, let me tell you, in some churches where the music is so loud you can't even hear yourself think. That's really, really difficult for me. And it's really difficult for me as soon as I'm done the talk and I come up to talk to someone there praying with me and the musicians come back on stage and start playing real loud in my, and, and that's happened a number of times. And let me tell you, I, even though I'm the guest, I will give them looks like for somehow they feel the need to start playing loud, loud, loud when people are coming for prayer and that. I mean, there needs to be a reverence there, an understanding of who the character of God is. And so worship should be something special. We're entering a time in the presence of the Lord. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm really with you there, Stephen. We need to have this this honor and this, this um, understanding who God is and who we are in the place. And I appreciate what you folks do here. Every time we've been here, and again, this is the third time, really felt like every time I come up, I've already been introduced to the presence of the Lord with your worship here. And so um, that's another reason we feel so wonderful and at home here. So bless you guys for doing that. Thank you. Uh, this is interesting. I'll let you answer it then. I'll, yeah, I'll just, answer. yeah. Actually, you'll see why you need to answer this one. Uh, is it biblical when Christians say one should be under the pastor's covering or their spiritual authorities covering? Uh, this question was, of course, with anonymity, written by a uh, visitor who, uh, I'm not their pastor, that's why they're asking. Of course, no one here would ask that question. Yeah, no, and that is a fabulous question. Okay, let me give you the passage. Unfortunately, I can say this, and you know this, you have a man who, yes, you can listen to his authority, you do follow what he says, uh, he is the leader. He is the God-given authority here. Hebrews 13, 7 and 17. Those are two verses there you need to know, underline, um, and take it wherever you're at, wherever you're at a church, wherever you visit, uh, to know. And here's basically what it says. You're to honor those, the shepherds who are in authority, if they do certain things. And there's two things they have to do. They have to teach you the whole counsel of God, the word of God. In other words, they teach you God's word. Numero uno, but number two, their life has to reflect it also. 
And when they teach you God's word and their life reflects it, you submit to them in their authority like you do here. And that's exactly what we all need to do. We go to churches, we find churches where we respect the pastor to the degree we not only listen to what he says, but we submit to the God-given authority that's there. And uh, that is so necessary to be able to do. And so, yeah, we do do that because God has placed people in authority like J.D. here. He has. He's given him, you know, he lives it. He teaches it and he lives it. And that's the type of people you want to be under, uh, their authority. We have a lot of callers that's, that say, you know, I go to this particular church and this pastor here says, you've got to do this because I say this. You've got to do that because I say that. And they're basically... It's an old doctrine called shepherding, shepherding, which is taken to the extreme. You can't make a move without asking the guy. And there's, they, first of all, they don't live it. But number two, they don't teach it either. So they're, they're wrong on both counts. So that's why you vote with your feet and go somewhere else. Uh, if the pastor's teaching you the word of God, uh, the lifestyle is co consistent with it, then you listen to him, you submit to him. End of story. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my wife wrote that. She wanted to know yeah, what exactly. Good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anybody have a question? Raise your hand. We'll come to you with the microphone. Don't be bashful. Yes, Wendell. Our state legislature recently passed uh, a bill. It's House Bill 444, and it's uh, gay um, and lesbian and homosexual, whatever, uh, asking for civil rights. And um, the governor took his time and vetoed that bill. But recently there's been a lawsuit, um, if you read today's paper, or last night's paper, on the front page of six couples. And I know myself that there are scriptures that say it's a sin, but I'd like to get your... The, the uh, result there, what happened was with us in California, we had the ballot measure and then uh, there was, you know, of the seven judges that there, there was a case that came before him recently and they voted four to three to overturn, you know, what the will of the people was. And of course, the obvious question is, well, why even bother to vote if you've got these unelected judges that are going to determine the will of the people? That's not the, the job of the judiciary. And so, yeah, um, we're going to see more and more of that. And the problem is um, you get... Um, in every state it's been voted on, it's always been voted, you know, the traditional view of marriage. But the problem is you've got two things going on. You've got a judiciary that's out of control, plus you've got a younger generation that's, that's being, you know, their brains filled with mush uh, that um, somehow that, you know, it's, it's fair and right, you know, you're, it's, it's bias, it's wrong to, you know, to, to define marriage one man, one woman. So we're seeing more and more of that go on. Um, we do our best. We want to stand up for the traditional view, but um, I'm afraid the day is coming. I don't know if we'll live to see it, where um, it's going to probably be not only the law of the land, but that's, you know, we're in the Sodom and Gomorrah days anyway, and as it was in the days of Noah, the days of Lot, Jesus said, before uh, his second coming. So think we're fight against it with everything we got, but think it not strange if you if you see something like that. So, yeah, we fight against it. We, we encourage our politicians to stand up for the traditional view because this has repercussions. If, if these things pass, then the kids in school are going to be taught, you know, like the book Heather Has Two Mommies and that sort of thing. Uh, so and so has two daddies, and you know, it's sort of this is the normal lifestyle. It's not the normal lifestyle. It's you know, God established marriage. He established one man, one woman. That's the only way society. That's the only way. In the, that's face. That's the only way we can reproduce, right? I mean, that's, <laughs> there's no other way than that. And that's how we multiply. Um, those with the uh, homosexual agenda have to recruit. They can't reproduce, obviously. And so there's there's that problem. But yeah, it's it's there. It's not going away, and unfortunately, the younger generation is being taught that you know the older us older people are dinosaurs, and the, the new way is to basically uh, allow anything anything to go. Okay, good. Um, by the way, I'm taking uh, questions that you write, and I'm kind of coupling them together with other questions written by somebody else that are similar in nature, with the hopes of kind of uh, getting them both answered for you. So this is one of them. And what I want to do with this, because it's kind of a multifaceted okay. question, all related. Okay, it's sure. a culmination of two questions. And I want to try to uh, answer in part uh, part of the question, because this was something that back in the 90s, I don't know if you remember this or not, uh, but you and I had this discussion about uh, the body, soul, and the spirit. So now here's yes, the question. Yeah. That. Okay, so here's the question. When a Christian dies, 
Uh, I know that the body is put in the ground and the spirit immediately goes to be with Jesus, but where does the soul go? Growing up, I remember our preacher telling us about soul sleep, which is a Seventh-day Adventist doctrine. Okay, uh, I'm going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna tackle the first part, and then I'm going to give you the rest of it, and you go can ahead. try to okay. wrap it all together and correct me. <laughs> oh, no, go ahead. As you know, I'm very correctable, right? You are. You, yeah. are. you don't make that many mistakes, J.D. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, except you know, there's not much, that much i got to tell you, at the, at the conference uh, during my session, I'm, I'm teaching out of 2 Corinthians 9, and, and I even said I, I should be really careful uh, when I talk about the Greek, you know, because Don's a Greek scholar, reads out of the Greek, and anyway... So in uh, 2 Corinthians 9, Paul writes and says, you know, God loves a cheerful giver, which is, you know, where we get our English word from the Greek word. We get our English word hilarious. So here I am. And I even said it. I said, I've got to be careful because, you know, uh, Don's the Greek scholar. So I, I go off on this whole rampage about hilarious. You know, when we give it, we just need to be, it needs to be just hilarious. And I'm, you know, all demonstrative and animated. And Don, bless his heart afterwards, said, you know, the, the original Greek <laughs> doesn't take it to the Level that you took it to. <laughs> so anyway, well, we thank saw, you. That's okay. We saw you in the confessional after. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Anyway, it has the meaning of being willingly of your own Gracious, volition. Graciously. Yeah. You. Graciously. Okay. Okay. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, Don. But uh, <laughs> here's the best way I ever heard it explained to me. Uh, we are triune in nature, created in the image of God, body, soul, and spirit. When someone dies, the body does go into the ground. Uh, the spirit goes to be with the Lord, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord in spirit. And then the soul is really, until we get our new bodies, uh, it is just we're not a living soul. Now, the best way I ever heard it illustrated was with a light bulb. When the light bulb dies, the bulb goes into the rubbish and then into the ground from where it was created. The electricity goes back to its source, and the light that had been created with the, with the electricity and the bulb has ceased. So when we're deceased, the bulb, like the body, goes into the ground. The spirit, like the electricity, goes back to its source. If born again by the Holy Spirit... We go to be with the Lord, absent from the body, present with the Lord in spirit. And that soul that our, is like the light. It's, it's deceased until we get our new bodies and then our spirit returns uh, with the Lord. Then we have uh, uh, our new bodies, our glorified bodies, and then we are a living soul for all eternity. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. I've the never... soul and the spirit is synonymous a little bit. Though. Many times. Many yeah. times, I, yeah. That's how I would, yeah, yeah. And okay. so soul and spirit are sometimes used synonymously. In fact, nephesh, the word translated soul in the New, the Old Testament, is actually translated by about 45 different, one Hebrew word, about 45 different English words, depending on the context. Soul can sometimes refer to the entire person. Sometimes it can refer to the spirit. It's synonymous with the spirit. Mm -hmm. Some, you know, and so it depends on the particular context, the word soul, how it's, how it's used there. All right. Uh, very simple. We are, we have a body or we are unity anyway, you know, God doesn't divide us up. When the body goes in the ground, the real us goes to be with the Lord at the resurrection. That's true. The body and spirit, the real us are joined together as a, as a, uh, unified being. And the soulishness, you can compare it this way, we are conscious of our existence. And some people have given this illustration. Animals, the difference between animals, plants, and humans. Animals have body, so, or humans have body, soul, and spirit. And the soul would be the awareness that we're alive. Animals have the awareness they're alive. Most of them do anyway. I had a rabbit I wasn't sure about <laughs> once, but that was um, dimly aware it was alive. But plants just kind of sit there. They don't, they don't have any awareness of it. Animals have a body and a soul in the sense they're aware of other creatures around them. Humans have a body and a soul, but a spirit where they can worship God and plants that kind of sit around have just the, the physical form. And so that's the distinction there. Genesis 1, 26 and 27, we have been made in the image and likeness of God. So the soulish idea depends how it's used in the context, you know, there. The soul can sometimes be identical with people. It can be, again, it's, uh, it, it's, it, it can mean many different things, but usually it's just referring to the person. Sometimes it just means you know, 45 souls were slain, 45 people, it's an entire person. So, yeah. Okay. Now, here's the rest of it. Okay. If the soul does sleep, where does this take place? When is the body, soul, and spirit reunited? 
at the time of the rapture or at the time of the second coming of Christ? Now, here's a related okay. question. Uh, where do the dead go? What is the difference between the grave, Sheol, Hades, hell, abode of the dead, Abraham's bosom? Oh, great question there. Uh, one of the uh, resources we have back there is a whole course I've done on that on the afterlife and uh, got about a thousand pages worth and we go into that in great, 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 great detail on these uh, little PDF files we have in books on uh, little CDs. Um, yeah, I've done a lot of work on that, so I've got to be careful not going too far on that. Uh, what was the first part of the question again? I, I was, uh, uh, the uh, when, oh, when, sleep. when, oh, yeah, soul well, yeah. soul sleep, but, but more importantly, uh, when is the, when do we get our new bodies, at the rapture or the second coming? Uh, we get a new, we get our new bodies at the rapture of the church. Some people actually argue people get their new bodies upon death, believers. It's a minority view. Second Corinthians 5 is the passage that people go to. Uh, we don't want to be unclothed. We want to be clothed. You know, we don't want to be found naked. We want to have this new body. When there's we die, there's a body eternal in the heavens, not made with hands. You know, waiting for us. Um, most likely, that's in the, not in the intermediate state, but in the eternal state. Here's what happens: body goes in the ground. Okay, spirit to be with the Lord. Three possibilities: we're either with the Lord like angels, and it's probably the best answer. Angels do not have a physical or corporeal form. Hebrews 1, 7, and 14, ministering spirits. God doesn't have a physical form, but he does very well in the unseen realm. There's no problem. We could be the same without a physical form somehow functioning there with the real us. How it happens, we don't know, but that's what we know happens in that area. Number two, a temporary body, which some people argue from 2 Corinthians 5. Uh, there's a body that's there waiting for the eternal one that's there in the unseen realm. And some people argue the third, that the glorified body is given immediately upon death. A minority view, I don't think that's the best view. Uh, here's the thing. The Bible is more concerned, not about the intermediate state, but the eternal state where we get this new body. First, Corinthians, uh, First Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, uh, the rapture of the church. Again, one of the books we've written is on that subject. And here's what happens. When the two things happen almost simultaneously, the dead in Christ rise first. When they rise, the body and spirit are joined together and that eternal glorified body is given to them at the same time the living believers are caught up to meet the Lord in the air but on the way up we are immediately trans when we're translated are caught up we're transformed this mortal puts on immortal this is uh, uh, corruptible puts on incorruption so simultaneously the dead in Christ the body and the spirits are joined together with a glorified body those who are alive are caught up and in a twinkling of an eye disappear and they change and they receive that new body. Now, it's interesting. Um, someone said, well, how God, how's God going to pull that off? You know, what have happened? You know, these people that you know, die 100 years ago, die in a fire, you know, been uh, uh, cremated or something like that. Um, a couple months ago, I got the best answer I've ever heard. I was speaking at uh, Calvary Chapel in Ramona. And because we were talking about that, I did a whole talk on the rapture. The guy comes up to me and says, doesn't it say somewhere in the Psalms that God has our, all of our tears in a bottle? I said, yeah. He says, well, he's got our DNA, right? Well, there we go. Uh, he's got our DNA all there, and he just puts it all together. So, well, that's as good as an answer I've ever heard. So he, he, the one who created the body, the DNA, I don't think he's going to have a problem putting all back together. So was that, now was there a second part of that I didn't get? Uh, and then what, what can you uh, draw the distinction between oh, okay, Sheol, okay. Uh, Hades, etc.? Yes, 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 very good. All right, here's the problem. In some of the older English version such as the King Jimmy Bible and that uh, what you have is the same word hell is done does many duties it's, tr it's translating the, he uh, the Hebrew word Sheol which means uh, depending on the context about five different things it can mean the grave the realm of the dead the unseen world um, it can mean you know um, just the afterlife itself generically without meaning the good side or the bad side of it. And Hades, the Greek term, can mean the same thing depending on the context. There's other words that are used in the, in the New Testament. You've got the word abyss, the abuso, which refers to the bottomless pit. You've got another word called Tartarus. It's only used in Second Peter, which is the abode of the, where the angels are chained, the, the ones that um, sin, the angels who sin. Second Peter 2, 4, been tartarized, it says. It's uh, the lowest parts of hell. Uh, the lowest parts of, of judgment. Then you've got Gehenna, which refers to the uh, lake, um, refers to a perpetual, as a garbage dump there in Jerusalem in Jesus' day where there's a perpetual fire going. So the same word, um, hell in some of the ancient versions, uh, or English versions, is used to translate a word for the grave, for the realm of the dead, the unseen world, 
the, the good side of the, the realm of the dead and the bad side of the realm of the dead. Well, that's, that's not real good. That's why we have distinct terms. So what happens is many translations will make the distinction now. He went to the grave. She went to the grave. He went to the pit or the place of unbelievers. He went to perdition, to judgment, or to his own place, it says in Acts chapter 1 of Judas Iscariot. Or some translations, what they'll do, they will just transliterate the Hebrew or Greek word. They went to Hades or they went to Sheol, meaning you figured out what it means in the context there. So because the context, it can mean uh, different things. There is the final judgment called the lake of fire, which is our traditional view of what hell is. And death and Hades, which are temporary um, uh, judgments, they are finally thrown in the lake of fire, Revelation 2010 and following where the uh, lake of fire is the eternal or the ultimate judgment. And Jesus seemingly used Gehenna, the, the perpetual garbage dump that never stopped burning to represent that. And so you've got different terms. So you've got Abraham's bosom, which I believe is synonymous with heaven. All right, um, so you've got the terms for heaven as the presence of God, the abode of God, heaven, um, Abraham's bosom, all represent in God's presence. But then you get these words like Sheol in the Old Testament can mean the realm of the dead, the grave, the afterlife, the unseen realm, uh, the realm of evil spirits in some context, depending on the context, context, Context. Con Did I, I don't know if I've done this with you here. If I have, forgive me, but this is very important. Um, any word, uh, the average word in Greek, just like in English, can have about five different meanings depending on the context. Because people often say the literal meaning of the term is this. And oh, they ask, what is the literal meaning of this word? I said, let me ask you a question first. What is the literal meaning of the word trunk? Tell me what it literally means. Trunk. Well... Literal meaning, well, tree, okay, uh, elephant, uh, car, uh, body, uh, you know, thing you ship something in, uh, well, uh, yeah, okay, see the problem? And so th there's no literal meaning, can mean a number of different things depending on the context. So a word by itself means, I use the one um, I like to use when lived five years in Australia, um, the word duck, okay. I say duck, what am I referring to? Am I talking about? You know, quack, quack, an animal? Is it, or is I talking about a verb, you know, duck? Now, how you use duck, depending on the context, can be one or two different things, right? Duck, you know, if you're duck hunting, you look up, but if there's hand grenades going around, duck means something totally different, right? <laughs> depending on the context. Well, the one I like to use, um, one of the things that living in Australia for five years, I became a fan of cricket. Um, uh, again, someone said it's kind of like baseball on Valium, what cricket is to explain it. But, uh, <laughs> But I liked it. I, I, got, I got into it. And the whole idea, you know, these guys can bat literally for a day and a half. And, but if a batsman gets up and he gets out without getting any run, it's called a duck. And so someone's out for a duck. So when you hear, you know, the, the first pitch or something like that and, you, you know, the guy, you know, gets batted out, the commentator will say, duck. Well, in that context, the guy's out for a zero and he has to walk across the whole pitch and they show this in the background, you know, on the screen, this, this duck went whack, whack, whack as he's walking off, and that's very embarrassing. He's got to walk <laughs> cap and hand out where he could be batting for a day and a half and first ball out, he's out for a duck. So anyway, it depends on the context. So the words based upon how they're using a con only mean what they mean in a context, but even more than that, let me give you another illustration. All right, I make this statement to you. He sold a lot of stock. What am I referring to? Well, depends on we're talking about, right? Am I talking about Wall Street? Am I talking about, you know, the general store? Am I talking about, you know, the farm? Again, so you need even, even a com complete sentence. You need a bigger context than that. And here's your basic illustration here. I don't know if I, again, forgive me if I use this with you guys. I've been doing question and answer at all these churches around Hawaii. If I repeat myself, forgive me. But in the 11th chapter of the Gospel of, of John, you've got two sisters of Lazarus, Mary and Martha, say the exact same thing. Or did we do this with you guys? No? Okay. No. They said this to Jesus. Remember Lazarus dead four days, Jesus shows up. The exact same thing word for word. Mary says, if you would have been here, my brother would have never died. Martha says, word for word the same in the Greek. If you would have been here, my brother would not have died. But now I know whatever you ask God, you will do. Word for word the same, the first part of it. But the inflection was totally different. Uh, Mary's saying it. If you had only been here, he wouldn't have died. Martha says, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. But now I know. If you ask God, I'll do. So even the inflection can make a difference. So uh, how do I get
get though, but never right. knows. Anyway, but uh, yeah, right. uh, yeah. I don't know how I got off on that. But anyway, <laughs> bottom line is words only mean what they mean in the context. That's what I got. Good, okay. good. Okay, let's take another question. Raise your hand. We'll bring you the microphone. All right. Thank you, Pastor Don. I got a question that comes out of Matthew chapter 24. Okay. And it has to do with verse 13. And it says, But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Mm -hmm. And it's also echoed in Matthew 10, verse 22. The question is, we've, all, we've often heard from the pulpit, once saved, always saved. Mm -hmm. So how does this um, correlate to this verse? Context, context, context. Remember what the questions he's answering there. Three questions in Matthew 24. When he talked about the city of Jerusalem being destroyed, the temple being destroyed, the disciples ask him three questions. You know, when shall these things be? What is the sign of your coming in the end of the age? He's talking about um, the, the, um, the end of the age before his coming. And he's talking about saved. Now, the word saved in Greek not all, it does not always mean saved from sin. Sometimes it means saved from, you know, your, your life is saved. It means delivered from something, you know, health and that. It depends upon the context, how it's used. The one that endures to the end, this one shall be delivered or be saved. Well, possibly in this context, he's talking about the time before he comes back. Because um, he gets on, actually in verse 15, it, talking about the abomination of desolation, 21, the great tribulation. Some people think saved in that context means if you endure to the end, you're saved to enter the kingdom of God because this is where it's open season on the Jewish believer, the Jewish nation, the Jewish believers at that time. And so um, we talked about last week the question of perseverance. And some people will argue, and they will use this verse, those that endure to the end will be saved. Uh, the fifth point of, of the uh, five points of Calvinism is perseverance, the perseverance of the saints. And you persevere in holiness uh, according to the... In the Point five of Calvinism to show that you're saved. The saints will persevere because they are, if we remember last week, they were the called, they're irresistibly, you know, God's irresistible grace is bringing them into the kingdom. And so um, Matthew 24, 13 doesn't necessarily have to do with something like that. And so the salvation here could be deliverance from the, um, you know, from death. And sometimes that, in fact, the word sozo in Greek is used many times of physical deliverance, not necessarily spiritual salvation. And even when it's used as spiritual salvation, remember salvation's in three tenses, right? You have been saved, justified when you come to Christ. You are now being saved. Uh, as you're a Christian, being sanctified, set apart, you will be saved someday when you're glorified. So you have been justified, you are being sanctified, you will be glorified. So basically, this verse is used sometimes with this whole question of perseverance of the saints. Uh, or eternal security, like we said last week, which are two different things. They are not the same thing. And it's funny, I was reading a very good commentary on Jude. Um, I won't mention his, his name, the commentator. I was almost going to recommend it when we did the thing on, um, on Saturday. But he gets him confused. He says, I believe, he's a Calvinist, but I believe in eternal security. And he was going on, he's confusing the terms. They're not the same thing, not at all. And um, sometimes this verse is used for that. But in the context there, Jesus is talking about enduring but until he comes back and sets up his kingdom. So the context there is one of, um, you know, eschatology or end times, end days. Now, 10, you said 1022 is the other one. Is that right? Um, look at that one real quick, if I can see it without my contacts. And if not, J.D., you'll have to read it for me. Let's see. 20. Matthew 1022. Yeah, uh, you'll be hated by all because of my name. But yeah, but and now, okay, the one who endures to the end, he shall be saved. Yeah, this is when he sent brother against brother and that. He's talking about fighting unto death. Um, Father, son, they shall rise, children shall rise up against parents, they shall put them to death. Okay, let's go back to the context now. Where does this start? Um, back in verse 16 there, I will send you as sheep in the midst of wolves. This is when he sends them out to uh, <coughs> preach the, the message of his kingdom. And again, um, there's an endurance promised here by the disciples. So in this context again, the endurance here to the end will be saved, the one who resists or fights to the end. It's referring to these disciples who were sent out. So Matthew 10, again, context is the disciples going sent out to all of Israel, presenting the kingdom uh, that uh, has arrived in the presence of the king. Matthew 10 is the offer of the kingdom. The kingdom is rejected. Then you get to 13, the kingdom parables and all that. Then into 16, he starts talking about dying and stops talking about the kingdom coming. So in this context, it's talking about these t disciples who he's going to protect. They're going to endure. They're going to be delivered. So the context there would not be eternal salvation. It would be, it would be physical safety. 
Okay. Good. In Revelation 13, 16 through 18, you know, he forces everyone great, yes. small, rich. Okay. Uh, it says that mankind will suffer because of Satan. This person will bring hell to earth. My question is, are we at that point now? Do we have to suffer that much before God comes and saves us? Oh, in the old words of, um, <laughs> this is going to date me. I'm going to date myself. Uh, <laughs> Bachman Turner Overdrive. <laughs> All right. What am I going to say, JD? B BTO, uh, taking care of business. No, not taking care of business. Oh, that's business. a different oh, one. What's the other one? Come on. What what's is the other one? Anybody? You don't remember? That's the only song I remember from them. You ain't seen nothing yet. Oh, that's okay. it. Yeah, you no, ain't seen it. nothing yet. Everybody now. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, don't get me singing these. We're all having notes. flashbacks, dog. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, I know. Me too. We don't want those to happen in the middle of preaching the flashbacks of the 60s. We, we got over that when we came to the, came to the war. But anyway, uh, so I thought somebody was going to ask me about this subject of the, of the, the, um, the Antichrist, the final Antichrist. The night, we're not getting that tonight because I did all this. I was going to get the question on Wally Chubats, the Muslim Antichrist, that is. But since no one asked me, I'll go on 13 to 16 about the problem, the Great Tribulation. That. Okay, here's what's happening. There's going to come a time, according to Matthew 24, 21. 70th week of Daniel, the midpoint of that, where there's going to be great tribulation, according to Matthew 24, 15, it starts with the abomination that causes desolation. It will begin this period, which has been nothing like ever in the history of the world, no, not towards the end, no, nor ever shall be. This is according to Jesus. And so Revelation 13 talks about that period of time. This has not happened yet. As bad as things are, and they are bad, but they're going to get so, so, so much worse. Now, there's persecution of Christians in many, many parts of the world, tremendous persecution even right now. We are blessed here in the States. However, it's for the saints at that time, the tribulation saints, it's going to be something absolutely terrible because this final Antichrist is going to basically declare open season on all um, you know, people who don't take the mark of the beast, and that will be, first of all, those from the nation Israel. He's going to try and wipe them out. But then people who come to Christ during that time. And so uh, any persecution that we have today is nothing compared to what this final Antichrist does when he shows up on the scene of history. And so now it's, uh, again, you literally ain't seen nothing yet. But the good news is, as believers, we ain't going to see any of it, to use the same analogy, because we're going to be out of sight with the Lord, right? So how, how will you for that? So Yeah, good. Yeah. Can you then uh, dovetail off of that, uh, if you wouldn't mind, and maybe uh, we could still get a, a one more question in. we got about 10 minutes, sure. but maybe just a couple minutes on uh, this whole Walid Shobat. It doesn't, doesn't seem to want to go away. Apparently, when he was here, he had quite an impact uh, here on the island. He spoke all over the island in some pretty big venues. Yes. Uh, and so we're still getting, you know, as you know, during the conference, we had that uh, call, and, and there's a lot of confusion because, uh, anyway... Okay, go, good. Go yeah, the one thing I wanted to deal with, first of all, let me say this. I've interviewed him. I believe he loves the Lord. What he's telling the world about Islam needs to be said. Is, Islam is not a religion of peace. It's a, you know, it's, it's a, uh, it, you know, it's not a peaceful religion at all. They're peaceful Muslims. It is not a religion of peace. It's attempting to conquer the world. If, it, if you don't do it by persuasion, it, they'll do it by sword, but they're going to do it. The problem I have, you know, with all due respect, is his eschatology. He believes the final, final Antichrist will be a Muslim. And he's, uh, from what I understand, I haven't heard him say this, but many people told me he's very dogmatic about it, says that with much authority. Again, with all due respect, uh, that is not only a, a very recent view, but it really can't be sustained biblically for a number of reasons. Number one, this final Antichrist makes a deal with the nation Israel. Uh, to confirm a covenant for seven years. Can you imagine your wildest ex, uh, you know, imaginations, Israel entering a, a security covenant with a Muslim? Uh, no, that will not happen. Number two, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 4, this supposed Muslim comes to the temple of God and claims to be God. Muslims only believe in one God, and that's Allah. They don't, you know, they, they are Unitarians. They reject the doctrine of the Trinity. A Muslim would, if a Muslim tried to say there is another God beside the God of Islam, they would be put to death immediately by Muslims. And so they would, he would not be received at that time. Third, he's talking about Shia Islam, which is only 10% of Islam. 90% of Islam is not looking for the final Mahdi, this 12th Imam, that Shia Islam. 90% of Muslims are Sunnis, and they are looking for a different type of deliverer, which is not the same type as Shia Islam. Uh, Islam has totally confused 
last day's eschatology, not only contradictory things, but incomplete things. So there's no systematic theology of what's going to happen in the last days. So uh, Wally Shubat, Joel Richardson, uh, Philip Goodman, I believe is his name, and, and what's the guy's name, Joe Van Covering, have all written books um, on, you know, being the, the, the Antichrist will be an Assyrian, but it's only Shubat that basically, and I think Richardson's too, says he's going to be a Muslim. This, no, no, it, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, even and the arguments that he's going to come from the <clears throat> eastern end of the Roman Empire, from either modern-day Iraq or Syria, doesn't, doesn't work either. But the idea of being a Muslim, because remember, he's going to confirm a covenant with Israel, um, number one. Number two, it seems this final Antichrist is going to allow the Jews to rebuild their temple on the Temple Mount. Now, if you know anything about Islam, every time they conquer a piece of land, it is theirs forever. They've conquered the Temple Mount. They took it over in the seventh century. They, were, they will not allow a, a Jewish temple to be built. Islam, believe me, on that presence. You can't go up there today on the Temple Mount with a Bible and open it up. If you try and preach there, they'll, they'll take you away. So the idea that somehow you're going to build a Jewish sanctuary, a temple there with sacrifices right there on... Not a chance on earth. A Muslim would not allow that to happen. Now, a non-Muslim, a European would, and because the, the final Antichrist will be a Gentile, the people of the prince that shall come, Daniel 9.26, is going to be the one who is the, this final Antichrist. He's a Gentile world ruler. He will uh, give the okay for the Jews to rebuild the temple and that, but he will not be a, believe me, he won't be a Muslim for a variety of reasons. Number one, um, that he's going to make a covenant the Jews are going to be able to trust him. Number two, we're going to build a temple there on the holy Islamic ground. No, a Muslim would never allow that and get away with it. They wouldn't accept him as a leader. Number three, claiming to be God. No, Allah is the only God. That's the, that's the whole, you know, first thing a Muslim, that's how you become a Muslim, by reciting that. Lahi Allah, yeah, yeah, la, yeah. yeah. Exactly. it's in Arabic. There's no exactly. other, yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Delete that from the tape. That wasn't a confessional statement. Yeah, that's that's right. Right. I, I just, that was that. tongues, Don. That, that, that was tongues. Yeah, we got. We'll get the interpretation there. Right? Yes. All right. But anyway, that was just for an illustration there. But yeah, that's the. Um, the yeah. And so no. I, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, we good thing for editing purposes. Yeah, so, uh, that was effects. Yeah. So effects, yeah. yeah. Uh, now uh, you had uh, referred me to a good uh, website that I think is uh, probably got a be the best. Uh, the Lamb Lion Ministries yeah. dot com. Yeah. Lamb, Lamb Lion Ministries dot com. Yeah, they have an excellent article on that on Muslim Antichrist. <laughs> David Reagan is his name, and he has a, a great article on that. And what's interesting, too, well, I know the guy's brilliant. He comes up with independently with the same things I did in my book on the final Antichrist. So I know the guy's got to be knowing what he's yeah, talking about. Right. <laughs> but, but anyway, no, but basically he, goes, he, he, he uh, reviews uh, Goodman's book, Shubat's book, Richardson's book. And I heard Richardson talk, actually, on a radio show. And his, his arguments are totally, totally unconvincing. All right. There's an old adage, if it's uh, true, it's not new. If it's new, it's probably not true. Um, you know, if something comes up a newfangled, new fad thing, and people like to jump onto that, immediately the red light ought to go up. How come no one discovered this first, all right? Um, the idea of the final Antichrist being a Muslim, like I said, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, the, the Jews are going to trust this guy, uh, and he's going to allow them to build a temple on the Temple Mount. Oh, this just doesn't make sense at all. Yeah, the other thing too, Joel Richardson, uh, I had ordered some of his uh, DVDs on this uh, right. subject, and uh, he uh, kind of blurted out that he does not believe in a rapture prior to the seven-year tribulation. If you don't hold that view, your eschatology is skewed yes, yes. right away. And, and, and I'm glad you said that, because it, once you get wrong on, on one thing with the eschatology, yeah. then you're going to be wrong on many things. Richardson, in fact, that's not even his name. He writes under a pen name. He's afraid to tell, him, tell us who he really is, which is another problematic thing, too. You know, that, uh, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're going to stand up and say you believe this, at least have the uh, wherewithal to let us know who you are. But, but anyway, um, yeah, David Regan, or Reagan, is Lion and Lamb Ministry, has a whole article on this, which I just basically quoted from, and, and uh, what he, he came up in, uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, another guy basically, you know, contributed to it, and it, you know, and it's the traditional view from, from, from Bible-believing Protestants who take, you know, or futurists who believe there's going to be a final Antichrist, he's going to be the last Gentile world ruler, he's the beast from the, from the sea, which represents the nations, is the second, second beast, is a beast from the land, probably Jewish, in that, 
He's going to, you know, rule the world. He's going to confirm a covenant with the nation Israel. They are going to believe in him and trust him. And so in that case, and he's going to then turn on them. And as he goes to the temple, he's actually going to claim to be God. You know, he's that. And again, by definition, Islam does not, you know, only believe in Allah. And they would, you know, they'd be stoned by the Muslims at that time, yeah. this person. But also, too, what they point out, which is very important, that he's got one branch of Islam, Shia Islam, which is popular in Iran, but it's only 10% yeah. of, the, of, the, of the Muslims in the world, which 90% are Sunni Muslims. So many, many problems with this. So if you want a great review there, David Regan's Lion and the Lamb is the, is the you know, Antichrist Muslim. Is he going to be an Assyrian, come out of ancient Assyria and that? And the arguments just, I mean, they just don't work. With all due respect to Wallace Shubat, his ministry, God bless him, keep preaching the message about Islam is a threat. We're not denying that, but the idea that the final Antichrist is Muslim just has so, so, so many problems with it. It's hard to, hard to believe. From what I understand, though, and again, I didn't hear him, there was a certain amount of dogmatism seemingly said with that, and that's where you're, and here, here's the point we really got to be careful with. When we're dealing with last day stuff, we can hold it. And again, if someone holds a different view, I have people all the time, they call up, you know, and they say, I believe in this and that. That's, I don't care. That's all right. You know, hold it lovingly. We can discuss it. Here's why I hold my point of view. And, and that's, and, and you, here's why you hold yours. That's fine. Let's discuss it. It's an intramural discussion among Christians, but let's do it lovingly. And let's not assume the other person is some type of, you know, lacking their spiritual or mental everything by holding a different view, you know, because, you know, hey, we may be wrong, and that's why we always, we, we check these things out. But to come and say, here's this new view that no one's come up before, I've got it, and this is it, and you got to believe it or, or say with such gusto, uh, mm -hmm. right what the red flags are, go right away. Yeah. Yeah. So we had a time now, it's 8.30? Yeah, let's, uh, okay, you want to? Thank you, John, very much. I'll, I'll answer questions after this. Isn't it interesting how fast time goes? I mean, it's, last Thursday, uh, we didn't have as much uh, time as we did tonight, but it seemed like about five minutes, and it was over, how time flies when you're having fun. Uh, different than my sermons. They seem to just go on and on and on. Anyway, Don, <laughs> thank you so much, Don. I really appreciate you uh, giving us uh, two Thursday nights this time. So. Why don't we have the worship team come up? We'll close in prayer, close in worship, and then go have some good grinds. <laughs> Father in heaven, thank you so much for this time that we've had. And Lord, I just really have this sense that you cleared a few things up for us. You've answered some unanswered questions for us. And really spoken by your Holy Spirit to our hearts pertaining to many things. And so, Lord, we're ever so thankful to you. We thank you for Dom. We thank you for his giftings and calling. And, Lord, we just pray your blessing on him. And just as he finishes out the week here on the island and goes back home, Lord, we just pray your blessing on him, of course, for travel safety. And, Lord, we just want to ask your blessing on him, his family, and, and his ministry. Uh, Lord, he's been such a blessing to us here, and again, we thank you for him. Uh, Lord, we want to also ask for your blessing on the food that we're going to eat tonight. We just want to pray that you'll not only bless the food to our bodies, but bless the conversation, bless the fellowship. Uh, Lord, we're grateful to you for how good you are, for who you are, for how you are. Lord, you're so good, you're too good. And Lord, we would pray, come quickly. Maranatha. So, Lord, thank you and, and uh, pray that what took place in this place was glorifying to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, remember, Don, uh, I told him before tonight that I don't know how he does it. He is so tireless. He has been speaking all week. We'll be speaking the rest of the week into the weekend, but uh, he has uh, agreed to stick around if you have questions, you had a question that you wrote down, never got asked, uh, never got answered, uh, please don't be bashful, Don. I'll uh, be happy to uh, try to answer those questions for you. He'll stick around uh, up front. I won't be anywhere to be found. You can find me by the food table. And uh, so anyway, God bless you. Thank you so much for coming. We're going to close in, in worship. Hey, Don, when was Harvest made? <laughs> what year? The 70s? The book?
No, the harvest is Pastor Chuck. The video. No, I'm not. <laughs> the 70s, huh? Yeah, there's a video out if you can get a hold of it. It's actually, it's called Harvest. And it, 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 it's a documentary on the, in the history and the story of the Calvary Chapel movement. And Don's in there. I think he's about maybe 20 years old. He's standing in front of a van. And this van, he was taking people down to Pastor Chuck Smith's church every weekend. But the th one thing I loved was that he said in that video, he said, you know, these people, they go down to this, this, these churches and they sit on these hard pews for hours and they listen to just someone teaching the Bible. And he said, these people actually believe this stuff. And it was beautiful to see because, yes, we do believe this stuff. Amen? Amen. Amen. Why don't we stand? Let's worship.